Hi, you're listening to Redneck Theology, a program providing a common sense look at Christianity. I'm your host, Bill Witte. Questions or comments may be emailed to redneck-theology at gmail.com. Now, on with the broadcast. Last time we looked at some aspects of receiving and following God's direction rather than our own. I promised this time we'd take it a bit further by looking at the application of faith in the direction slash guidance process. Walking by faith requires believing in God's ability to create. Each time we find ourselves in a position to receive direction from God presents an opportunity to see His creative ability anew. When we seek His direction, especially when it seems unnecessary, we open a conduit for His creative talent, manifestation, and genius to flow through. Seeking the Almighty for guidance in every decision looks good in print, and it sounds good in theory. When put in practical application, it tends to give calls for those who practice the uh, procedure regularly to receive labels, you know, such as uh, fanatic, weirdo, religious nut, Jesus freak, uh, other unflattering names. Since God often acts in unusual methods, those accustomed to turning to Him in everything generally ignore the labels or accept them as kind of a badge of honor uh, since anyway Jesus told his followers that they would be persecuted for following him uh, you can read that in Matthew chapter 5 verses 10 through 12 many well-meaning individuals in the past claimed to speak or act under God's anointing as they carried out activities uh, many of which ended in disaster the disasters in the name of religion present clear examples of what happens when man begins to take control of a godly plan. Remember the example cited uh, in the earlier broadcast about Moses? If you weren't with us then, I'll just recap quickly. Uh, one occasion, the children of Israel, were, they were in the desert and following Moses, and they were concerned they might die of thirst. So they called on Moses, complained against him, fussed, argued, Moses went to God, he prayed, God told him strike a rock and water would flow from it. He did so. No problem. They got the water. Wasn't too long after that they were in a similar situation. They needed water. They were thirsty and they start complaining, grumbling against Moses again. Moses goes to God again. This time God tells Moses speak to the rock. So take your rod, speak to the rock. Well, Moses took his rod and possibly did listen very closely because when he got to the rock, he hit it again. As a result, God didn't hold it against the children of Israel. The water flowed, but he told Moses he would not enter the promised land for his disobedience because this time God had said, speak to the rock. And instead, Moses struck it. God used him as a leader. He provided instructions for every step of the journey. When Moses became comfortable with the plan, and he took for granted that he knew what the next step would be, he found himself in trouble. Throughout history, God changed things, but he himself never changed, and he never will. He is the one great constant of all. Hear me now, the one great constant of all and in all existence. Because of his consistency, a standard to measure actions and decisions against presents itself to us, the properly interpreted Word of God. Now the correct interpretation of a given verse may bring disagreements, and the disagreements may center around how do we define properly the Apostle Paul gave a direct charge to his protege Timothy to study the Word in order to receive the ability to discern it properly. In the, uh, the second chapter and 15th verse of 2 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy, saying, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. The key to rightly dividing or interpreting comes from study of the entire text, not just a few selected verses. Any plan 
direction, program, or uh, other supervision we might claim receiving from a, a divine source must line up to the total, complete overall message and counsel of Scripture. Contradictions appear within the Bible, but the Bible does not contradict itself. God's plan in any given situation agrees with the directions already given in the Bible. Since the Bible reveals His plan, any revelation contrary to it stands in opposition to that plan and must originate from a different source. The statement, God expects us to use common sense, only applies if common means the common truth or truths and principles of the Bible, and sense refers to putting the revealed truths and principles into practice. Truth remains constant. How we view and apply it, that changes. Seeking God's will must rank first in our priorities if we hope to walk in His truth. God instructs us to follow Him. Often we follow someone else who appears to follow Him instead. When someone makes a change in their actions or embarks on a new venture claiming the plan came from God, it seems like it only takes a short time and everyone seems to receive similar revelation. Now granted, under-shepherds working for the same chief shepherd undoubtedly receive the same instruction for guiding the flocks, at least at times. They also expect specific guidance for their individual flock. Sheep personalities differ, so methods of dealing with problems in various herds require different approaches. Some practices work well in all groupings and become generally accepted and implemented, and others must be flock-specific. You know, one church experiences a crazed gunman entering their sanctuary. He murders innocent parishioners, and soon all the churches in the city hire armed security officers. A television evangelist expresses his gratitude to those supporting his ministry by sending them a coin from Israel. The next week, most all the TV preachers start giving some similar coin as an incentive for sending offerings. Did the direction each received come from God? Probably not. Did God give similar ideas to several people? Possibly. Using an idea that works for someone fails to fall into the category of sinning. Implementing that same program without asking God first, that, however, represents an attitude of superiority. The label fanatic might be applied to the person stopping to seek God in each choice. Directions to make decisions and plans based upon past experiences and learned wisdom sometimes come from God. We must exercise caution not to assume he gives that exact same direction in every similar instance. Wisdom, learning, experience gained from interaction with God and his word provide a place to start drawing resources from. Time spent alone with God in prayer gives opportunity to hear from him. Asking his advice in all things takes time. Seeking divine guidance also demonstrates a willingness to submit our will to one that's greater. God did give us intelligence, and he expects us to use the brain he provided. The biblical record of Christ's ministry shows he selected disciples, gave them direction and training, and sent them out. He expected them to use their brains to decide the proper course of action in each instance based upon the teaching, example, and and instructions he already provided. The Bible provides us with basic examples and teachings to base our actions upon. Nowhere in the chain of command do we see an example of a servant running back to the master for every single detail. For instance, a a cook may prepare a meal without going to the next person in the uh, chain of command or the next one in authority above them for each recipe or for each list of ingredients, or for each ingredient on that list. Likewise, we possess the ability to carry out tasks assigned to us 
without God looking for us to ask him how to complete each single solitary required component. At some point, we may find ourselves unsure of the next ingredient in the soup. Well, then an open door policy exists for asking the chief chef what to do. Asking, rather than guessing or assuming, may result in the difference between a palatable meal and a poisonous one. I fixed some French toast the other morning, and uh, my granddaughter likes a little cinnamon on it, so I reached in the drawer to get some cinnamon. Someone had also put another container in there, same size container, same color, from the same company. However, that container contained Cajun seasoning. Fortunately, I saw the difference and picked up the cinnamon. Had I put Cajun seasoning in the French toast, it would have been totally different. Uh, I'm not sure my granddaughter would have ever allowed me to cook for her again if I had done that. We have to be willing to ask God what to do. But we also need to recognize that brain he gave us, he gave it to us for a reason. You know, asking, uh, asking God what color socks to wear could seem to be an example of taking things to the extreme. But being willing to ask him what socks to wear puts us in a position to hear his voice should he see some reason to intervene in such a manner as that. I speak from experience in this area. <laughs> Several times in my life I've experienced God telling me not to wear a particular item that I chose. Often I found out later in the day reasons why my original choice proved inferior to what God chose. I believe God made the right choice for me even when I received no confirmation to that effect. I don't get up in the morning and seek God's direction for my wardrobe. I do remain open to his suggestion and I expect him to tell me when I make a bad choice. Even if I started asking him what clothes to wear every day, what could it hurt? So what if someone calls me a fanatic? God knows what lies in our future each and every minute of every day. Why not check out our preparedness with him? Do you check the weather forecast before planning outdoor activities? Jesus didn't set up scenarios ahead of time of what to do if trouble occurred in every situation. He did seek the Father's will and directions when faced with problems and opposition. Okay, make plans. Have a backup ready. Prepare for the unexpected. Just ask God first how he wants it handled. You might still make mistakes, but you'll never go wrong. That's our program for today. I'm Bill Witte thanking you for listening to Redneck Theology. Your questions or comments may be emailed to redneckTheology at gmail.com. Please join me again for more Redneck Theology.